Hello everybody, my name is Jay Santos, I'm the Developer Relations Manager at Improbable, and today I'm going to talk about the work Improbable's online services did to increase the capacity of the scavengers lobby to 100,000 CCU. Before we begin, uh, and just to frame this presentation in time, the tests described happened uh, in late 2019, early 2020, and those were uh, pre-alpha closed public tests. Uh, with that said, let's get started. Let's start with a quick recap of what the scavenger lobby actually is. As a player, the lobby lets you see other online players and lets you form parties with these players. It also lets you queue as a party, where eventually you'll be given a team and a server. These are the core features of the lobby. And this is a quick summary of how external playtests went uh, in terms of the lobby. So you can see for PT4 in November 2019, by the way, PT stands for public test, the lob got a thumbs down emoji. And that's because there was a period of time during the test where players were unable to press the click to ready button. And of course, that is not good. And the result of that, the online services team were brought on board in late January. Unfortunately, PT5 was also thumbs down. We'll talk about PT5 later. But in the time leading up to PT6, we did some great work and getting a lobby to a point where not only was the playtest successful, but close to a point where scavengers could actually be launched. And the process of how we got there is what we're going to talk about. So let's get started talking about PT5. So coming up to PT5, we had not a lot of time to get the lobby over the line. We knew there were a lot of issues in its current form, but a rewrite and re-architecture were off the table with the timeline that the team had. So one of the first things the team worked on was creating a lot of unit tests. Something like 90% of the code coverage where there wasn't really any before. And actually, to give you an insight of the dimensions of the code base, the team often had to mock tens of classes to unit test a single method. So it was a little bit of a mess. But this exercise was really useful. Not only did the team spotted a lot of bugs, but it gave it some confidence in making changes having those tests. And most importantly, it gave the team a really solid understanding of how the lobby actually worked at that moment in time. The team also prepared for a lot of bugs that came with the play tests. So anything that went wrong, the team would investigate and make fix fixes if needed to. And we had sprints at this point, which were almost entirely bug fixing. But at some point, we stopped getting bugs, which was pretty promising. And the last key thing that the team did was load testing the fake players, the simulated players. And the results we were seeing from that weren't very impressive at all. But at least for the number needed for PT5, they were good enough. So going into PT5, the team felt pretty confident. But that was pretty quickly corrected. So reminiscent of what we saw on PT4 for about the first hour, players weren't able to queue and therefore getting in the game. We were able to mitigate issues slightly by restarting the lobby a few times but it was pretty bad in general. Eventually, we realized that this is correlated with players connecting from high latency regions. So, for instance, people connecting from China seem to have a big impact in lobby performance. And things actually calmed down quite a lot when we asked people in China to stop connecting. But we were still seeing issues in spite of that. And obviously, when things go wrong, people start spamming buttons and the way the lobby was architected at that point, that only made issues worse. So after PT4, there was a lot to unpack. And we run a kind of five whys style post-mortem, where you basically handle issues like players unable to join a game, and you kind of chain together why over why over why until you hit what you believe is the root cause. One of the key takeaways from that exercise was that our load testing was way too friendly. So there were a number of things 
like players didn't join parties on our low tests, they didn't drop out randomly, and then crucially, they didn't actually connect in adverse network conditions. And the other takeaway from that was that actually we had a lot of passing tests and we had squashed a lot of bugs because it was quite hard to understand where there was always an opportunity to be surprised. And that's exactly what happened. So now let's talk through some of the key things we did to move forward and get the logging process in a far better state. If you remember, there are three things the lobby does, which are presence, lobbying, and matchmaking. By far, the one with the most complex code was matchmaking. To give you a sense of how complex it was, there were four priority queues involved in the logic. A party is waiting for team's queue, a team's waiting for party's queue, a server waiting for team's queue, and a team's waiting for server's queue. Beyond being extremely hard to understand, this was really bad in terms of performance. The whole flow is doing a lot of looking up and generally expensive operations. And since the service as a whole was a node service and single threaded, this had a major impact on the performance of everything. And there's a lot we could have done to improve that code. But now that we actually had a fair amount of time, we decided to rip out matchmaking completely. So the team took Google's open source matchmaking solution called OpenMatch. We added our custom logic for how scavengers need matchmaking to work and the lobby into that. So the lobby now access OpenMatch and say, I have a party that wants to join this type of match. OpenMatch would then return a ticket to the lobby and the lobby would watch that ticket and eventually get back a team and the server to get brought into. Of course, with OpenMatch being a dedicated matchmaking solution that was far easier to write matchmaking logic and with a way better performance. And we had actually taken time to play around with OpenMatch beforehand and actually spike out an integration. So we knew going into this that this would actually work. And as part of this re-architecture, we set up a suite of tests that would treat OpenMatch like a black box and use the same interface the lobby used. And these tests would verify, for instance, that we got matches back when we expected it. And all of the team forming and everything looks good. So these tests were written in a kind of a data table style. So in this example here, the test takes uh, two times the maximum number of player, makes them queue, allows enough time for matchmaking to happen, and then checks if two matches worth of players get back. And previously, the option to test matchmaking was either do a lot of mocking or use simulated players that will hit several layers of functionality before even hitting the logic we wanted to test. So this is just illustrating that with the re-architecture, we not only simplified our code and performance, but it also made testing a lot easier as well. Moving forward, a large scale factor was something we were all looking forward to eventually happen. And that was one of the most important improvements for PT6. And in this slide, you can see a much celebrated pull request that actually killed 10,000 lines of code. Before this refactoring, a single request would go through a chain of several different monolithic controllers. And it wasn't through functional calls, it was through signal passing and this was extremely hard to follow where what was happening to a request and why. So with this big refactor, we basically got to a point where every request handler was pretty much self-contained in its own class and things were just way more readable and sane. And this allowed us to make testing easier and making changes quicker. And it also helped us find a lot of potential bugs and kind of scenarios that we need to defend against that were previously hidden in our complex lobby. We also had a suite of tests that would make connection masquerading as players in addition to our unit testing. Here are included some of the test case names, just to give you a flavor of what these tests actually did. This wasn't a new thing. There was already a setup for this in the old code base, but we spent some time investigating on that setup to make a better rig that has made tests easier to write and behave a little bit more sanely. 
And as we kind of re-implemented a lot of this functionality, having ripped a lot of it out as part, as part of the big refactor, we were writing a lot more of these tests as we went along. So we had way more coverage coming into PT6. As mentioned, we did have a load testing prior to PT5, but that needed a major overhaul. Uh, and what we did on our overhaul was including better metrics to track what was actually happening to our simulated players. We also included some tooling to make players disconnect, tooling to simulate bad network conditions, uh, do things like set up percentage packet loss and artificial latency, which as mentioned early, was one of the issues that we had when using simulator players in PT5. And this slide is actually showing the interface we exposed on the internal admin panel. So the actual kind of flow for starting a load test as a developer was uh, you could just go to a page, fill in this form and click start. And that was pretty useful. It even allowed people from other teams who wanted to try out the lobby. So that was quite, quite nice. So with our improved UI testing setup and also some better performance metrics for our actual components, we were able to start working on scale. And throughout this whole operation, we weren't just targeting the minimum we needed to get the lobby over the line of PT6. We were thinking about what we need to do to get our lobby product ready. So as part of that, we had a goal to hit 100,000 CCU, which was obviously way beyond what was needed, uh, talking strictly about PT6. And the scaling work was actually surprisingly straightforward. Ultimately, from a top level, it was just a matter of providing uh, more resources to the lobby and to OpenMatch. Uh, and interestingly enough, most of the discussions we were having were about how we would support multiple lobby instances and how that would work. But it turned out we could actually hit this 100,000 CCU target with just a single instance. So as we got closer to PT6, the team ran something that they called the monkey games which was basically a set of resilience tests. And we thought that that was a pretty good idea, so we copied it. And the idea is to basically identify all of the ways components might fall over or become unreachable, and how we expect the system to recover when this happened, if it happened at all. And then actually tests that that situation happened. So for example, we could simulate that uh, PlayFab went down. Uh, we could figure out what we expect the system to do and then just check if that behavior was happening. So the example I have here is where a pod running one of our open match custom components falls over. We just wanted to verify that matchmaking deleted it. And these were the things we were able to address prior to PT6. As you probably guessed from the title, a pre-mortem is a meeting where we try to preempt the stuff that could potentially uh, end up being covered in a post-mortem. So in this meeting, we had a table where we could add entries to describe things that could go wrong, how likely they were to go wrong, and how much of an impact that would have. So in this example, we realized that if the lobby fell over, beyond requiring players to just reconnect and requeue, actually the way we integrated with OpenMatch meant that some players would end up in a mostly empty match. And this was really bad. So even though we thought the likeness of this happening was quite low, this was something we ended up mitigating ahead of the test. So that completes our presentation through the work that we did uh, starting before PT4 all the way throughout PT6. And just to summarize, we simplified the lobby massively so that large scale refactoring and also breaking out uh, one of the most complex things in the lobby, which was matchmaking, into this very solution. We tested bad network conditions because we just hadn't done that uh, in the previous test and we had issues. And we also had to hit a scale, uh, not only hit the scale, but go way beyond what we needed with 100,000 CCU. We verified that the system was resilient and would actually recover if things went wrong. 
And lastly, we thought practically about what could break and made sure we mitigate those things ahead of the test. And when PT6 finally came around, this is what it felt like to be in the war room. The only issues we actually encountered were a handful of players that failed to connect to the lobby. But all these cases came down to bad network issues. And we actually had one guy who eventually revealed that he was based on an island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it wasn't actually lobby issues, it was just people with really bad connections. And here on the slide is a call out the team got from Josh Holmes, which is one of the founders of Midwinter, basically to say that the lab performed flawlessly. So to wrap things up, I'll quickly mention a couple of uh, big takeaways that the team had from the whole uh, experience. The first one, which is not news for anybody, is that complexity is very expensive. But these tests that we did have shown us uh, to what extent this was true. With the old lobby, onboarding was really slow. Making those changes was really scary and required us to do a lot of reading and thinking of events. And also, bugs had loads of places where they could hide. And we ultimately had to rewrite a lot of it. Uh, a lot of that complexity came from the intent to future proof it or optimize performance. And in the end, a lot of engineering time uh, was spent as a result of this. This is a pretty good reminder of how important it is to make sure uh, you're keeping your coding systems as simple as they can be, especially if they might, uh, if they might need to grow into something bigger in the future. And the second takeaway is just to make sure that we're being proactive about identifying risks and weighting them up. When we had a scheduled discussion, the pre-mortem for PT6, that was a really nice thing. And it led to revealing a lot of things that wouldn't be addressed. Uh, obviously, this is something that we don't need to do on a meeting. We can just make sure we're doing it ahead of time. And thinking about PT5, if we had asked ahead of time, what are the risks? and work on the most important ones, like testing connections in poor network conditions, uh, and we could prioritize that ahead of the known bugs that we were fixing. So we got to the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you want to know more, if you or if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me uh, at the email jcentos at improbable.io. Uh, I would like also to ask you to fill out the survey uh, it's just a couple of questions. It's 100% anonymous. You don't need to submit your email. But it's really important for us to get to understand uh, if this kind of content is useful, if it is interesting for you, so we can do more of this uh, in the future. Thank you very much, and I see you soon.